first of all, I always appreciate the opportunity to um, talk to my partners up north. Uh, it was hard getting here over the wall that you guys are building to keep us out, but uh, I made it. So uh, I typically, when I give speeches, uh, I let everybody know I used to work for the government and now I don't, so I can tell you the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm now a cyber evangelist, and what does that mean? That means that I'm trying to get everybody to wake up. I'm um, trying to get everybody to understand that the government is not coming to save you. There's no policy, there's no um, thing that runs through our environment, sort of a digital DNA that's going to protect our individual systems. To some extent, we're all on our own, right? And that's the truth. So I will tell you that the cyber threat against us is getting worse. Let's see if you agree with this. Uh, cyber attacks and breaches are becoming more sophisticated, they're, more, they're increasing. Um, you're hearing about them more publicly, which tells you a lot. Um, the targeting of organizations and individuals um, has become more extreme to the point, for instance, uh, one organization uh, said that they were going to cut off the head of uh, an executive at Facebook because of something that was going on online. So things that are occurring digitally are now becoming physical in nature, right? Uh, hacktivists are now working with organized criminals. So the environment is changing very, very quickly, and we're not keeping up. Also, our current perimeter detection, uh, current intrusion detection systems, they're not working. And when they do work, it doesn't matter because there are so many opportunities for people inside of your organization to poison the well that you have to have a way to understand what's going on in your environment and not just depend on that intrusion detection system. And then the criminals are leveraging every new innovation that we have, right? Every time we come up with a new type of encryption, they have it. Uh, it just came out recently that I think it's Cloudflare was providing services to like five different organizations that are on the US State Department's terrorist watch list. So they're getting the best and they understand what the threat is and they're protecting themselves. So when the criminals start protecting themselves, you know you better do the same, all right? So, I know for which I speak because I chaired the communication sector. Um, that's like the Verizon, Sprint's, T-Mobile's, that sort of thing. I uh, rolled out a program for cyber threat information sharing, a new policy for the White House. Uh, I led an information sharing organization that had uh, companies representing 15% of the US GDP. And I also led a network security information exchange, which was cybersecurity experts from uh, UK, US, and Canada. So I worked a lot with CSERT, Rogers, all of your telecom companies. Uh, and I will tell you that the issues that we have, you have. They don't stop at the border. And that's a very interesting thing because when we approach cybersecurity as, for instance, the way that we did with terrorism, it's the wrong approach. Uh, cybersecurity and cyber issues are more like public health issues. That's why they call these things viruses, right? They have the opportunity to infect you and to keep infecting you, all right? Did anybody see the new reporting about a thing called deep fake? So the deep fake, you can now undermine what we believe to be true in video. That's really important because our systems and our systems of democracy are based on us understanding things that we believe are true, right? Um, I've been going around telling people, speeches, writing, democracy is under threat. I'm not here to talk about democracy, but I will tell you that the only thing that I believe 
can undermine and bring democracy down are cyber threats. And not from just attacking the biggest companies in the world. It's from changing the opinions, thinkings of everyday regular people. And part of that involves lulling them to sleep. Most people hear about security breaches. They have no idea what it means that in January 2019, there were a billion records stolen. What does that mean? What does it mean that can, uh, China, Canada, China is hacking us and stealing records and intellectual property and they have no way of making this, any of this make sense? Well, what it means is that that data, along with other forms of publicly available data, now provides someone, an entity, an organization, an opportunity to own you. And when I say own, that's an important concept because the right of privacy is really important to us. Think about it. You go to the doctor, you keep your records private. There are even laws about keeping your records private. HIPAA, right? Um, but you also go to a psychiatrist, they don't necessarily want anybody to know that. And sometimes, depending on what kind of job you have, they may kind of have a problem with that. So there's so many things with us personally that we want to keep private that for someone to have pieces of information that can be sewn together to create a story about us, it's damning. Now, what is the government doing about this in Canada, US, or anywhere else? Let me just tell you that they're so busy trying to protect themselves and protect critical infrastructure that it becomes very hard for them to protect private businesses and individuals. OPM breach, 2015, 21 million records were stolen. OK, there are millions of records stolen every day. But these were contractors, people with clearances, FBI agents, military people. And oh, by the way, their families, their medical records. And guess what? We work really closely with Canada. So the people who have clearances from Canada, their records were stolen too, right? And so all of a sudden, the things that we hold of great high value are hard to protect. So if OPM can't protect those sensitive records, man, do you, think, you guys think you have a chance against a nation state? Something really interesting occurred with the OPM breach, though. When DHS responded to that to help them, we saw the individuals in that system trying to figure out what they were doing. Because the first thing that you think that you want to do is cut it off, kill it. But it's actually important to understand what they're doing. So made sure that there were no sensitive records at risk, made sure that we started metering what was going out of the system so that they could only take it out at a very slow pace to understand what the goal was and potentially who was doing it. The hackers got to a mainframe, old legacy technology. It's the old savior. The hackers got to a mainframe, and it was almost like they couldn't figure out how it worked. <laughs> Left for two weeks, and literally, it was like they went out and recruited somebody that knew how to do mainframes because they came back and they started zooming away. One of the great dangers that we face is we're not working together, sharing cyber threat information. The hackers are. They're teaching and training each other every day, 24 hours a day, not nine to five. Also, the way that our open societies are set up, we all want convenience. We live in a shared, uh, shared uh, culture, right? We got Ubers and we got Airbnbs and 
it's working great for us. Keep the prices low, and we all get to share in a little bit of that convenience and fun. Well, guess what? Here's what happens. When security goes up, convenience goes down. When convenience goes up, security goes down. Don't forget that, because that's probably what's happening within your companies, right? That's what's happening within your organizations. I always get a lot of hemming and hawing when I'm in a cybersecurity conference and I go, cybersecurity is a buzzword. What are you talking about? That's what I do for a living. You just kill me. Well, the way that you understand cybersecurity is to think about it in terms that you already understand. Cybersecurity is risk management, which means you have to understand the vulnerabilities, the threats, and the consequences. That's where that information sharing comes from. Because if you were sharing cyber threat information with partners and people you trust, you would understand when they were hit or hacked or something happened to them. And you would understand the consequences because they would trust you to share it with. In understanding vulnerabilities, threats, and consequences, you can now take that information and merge it with your other risk management systems within your company. Companies understand liability. Companies do not understand cybersecurity. We just gave you $20 million last year for technology expenses. Why do you need more this year? Well, the attacks have gone up. Well, why didn't you stop the attack? And those individuals that have the experience, the CISO, the one that was there when you got attacked, we dismissed them. Even though there's a 1.8 million person shortage of cyber professionals headed our way. So this leads me to my next point. You have to use the people within your organization as sentries. They have to be the first line of defense. That means you don't just give them IT training so that when they pass this thing that they're sharing answers about, they can use your information systems. They have to understand the challenge. And what you'll find out in capitalistic societies is that when you give people a challenge and you tell them those guys are trying to get in here and take something from us that's going to hurt us and eventually hurt you as the employee, those people will stand up to the challenge. Okay. The one point that I always like to make, IT professionals are not cybersecurity professionals. And I say that because we count on IT professionals for access. The CEOs of companies are the worst offenders. They want access. They want the systems up and running. But here's what happens. When you have an issue, the IT guy will show up, change the system that's not functioning out, and it's up and running again. The cybersecurity guy will show up and look at the logs to understand what occurred. They're both super important. But there has to be a relationship that lowers the risk for the company. You should also be trying to develop a culture of cybersecurity within your organization. What does that mean? A culture of cybersecurity involves making those individuals who work there down to the secretary a part of your risk management system. Why is that important? It's important because social engineering is the way that hackers are getting into companies, getting passwords, 
figuring out how to become a part of the network. People assume that they're getting hit with these great attacks from these unbelievable hackers who have these skill sets and they're breaking through your intrusion detection systems. And in a lot of cases, they're just spoofing an identity or they are relating themselves to someone that works within your organization. We typically call an insider threat, someone who has malicious intent. But essentially, every employee has the opportunity to become an insider threat. And so, you know, um, Dave talked about the zero trust. That's where that comes in, right? People who should not have administrative privileges should not have administrative privileges. I've, again, I work with a lot of CISOs and people at very major corporations, and they tell stories about how an executive comes in, and the first thing they want to do is give them access because they're an executive. Well, if they have no need to have administrative privileges on IT systems, they shouldn't have it. It creates another liability, which takes us back to Cybersecurity is risk management. So why should the employees care? Let's think about this. We got a lot of conundrums going on here. We can't even define cybersecurity. If you go to any physics class anywhere in North America, they will tell you force, mass times acceleration, right? If you go to any school that teaches cybersecurity, or if you go talk to 50 cybersecurity experts, you'll get a de different definition from each of them. So how are we going to figure out this problem as partners when we can't even agree on the definition? And then, oh, by the way, technology just keeps coming, keeps rolling, IoT. Most IoT devices are hackable. Smart cities. We're in the process of building autonomous vehicles in smart cities. I was working with Vegas and Jacksonville recently. And the vendors that are there providing services, they've never had a third party look at their code. If you build a technology on vulnerable code, that technology is going to be vulnerable. Well, there's no rules in place to make people go get those things checked. Therefore, the onus falls on the individual. It falls on the entity or the company. Just because when you turn on the news every night, you don't see small companies lawyers' offices, doctors' offices, um, going out of business because they've been attacked does not mean it's hap not happening. It's happening every day, all the time. In a U.S. congressional report, they reported that within six months of a breach, most small businesses are out of business. You just didn't hear about them. On the global scale, we have another issue that proves the point that the government is not coming to save you. NATO. NATO hasn't defined cyber war. Right? There's a reason for that. It's because when we invoke Article 5, that means that we come to each other's defense. We're under attack every day. There's a cyber war going on every day. And if we defined it the way that we define war, we'd be in World War III. Okay? All of your employees, probably all the people in this room, are all wondering, must not be that bad. Must not be that bad. NATO can't define, has never said we're under cyber war. The government 
She's not really saying anything on TV every night. And oh, by the way, I came from DC. I caught a train, went through the airport, went to LaGuardia, walked through the airport, came to Montreal, caught an Uber, and I never saw one sign having anything to do with cyber threats. Unless it was for a university or for a defense contractor who is trying to sell to the government. Not one sign. I saw breast cancer awareness, seat belts, um, some other medical issues, um, cannabis, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Oh well. And oh, and I love the sign that you guys have in the airport <laughs> that says that I have to declare my cannabis products. What is this? Right. <laughs> so um, the priorities that other entities and individuals have put on protecting your cyber life cannot be your priority. Because when it's over, it's over. Thank you.